Platonic Reflections on Man by Christoph Martin Wieland In the infinite ladder of living and ensouled creatures man stands, it seems, in the middle and connects the world of spirits with the incalculable kingdom of animals. According to his shape he seems nothing more than the most beautiful and noblest of the animals, but his works show that English faculties in this body are limited. Reason also gives his sensuous faculty an infinitely wider extension than that of other animals. With eyes weaker than an eagle's, he sees the farthest stars, penetrates the depths of the sea, and bears the bowels of the earth. His imagination discovers innumerable worlds for him and imitates the Creator from afar, who, in one sight, can summon a sky of order and beauty out of thin air. He retrieves the past and gives it a second reality, he overlooks the present and even uncovers the curtain of the future. By being able to put his concepts in order, he is able to receive innumerable sensations and ideas that would otherwise have been lost in the crowd. And by being able to discover the rule of the beautiful and the pleasant, he can stretch the limits of his pleasures almost to infinity. Take away his reason and leave only the animal, man will feel in a very small circle, he will always have the same ideas, he will always do enough of the few instincts of nature, every day will be the one before it, it will be a clock, which always runs the same way until it loses motion. An animal is not master either of the impressions it receives from outside, or of the impulses that are excited by them. It can neither increase his joys nor diminish his pains. Man feels almost every pleasure three times and each time accompanied by its own irritations. He anticipates it, he enjoys it before it's there, and hope magnifies it before his eyes. After enjoying it, he may renew it as often as he pleases, and, by means of a little delight wrought by the wondrous springs of the imagination, raise it almost to the vividness of real sensation. His feelings are finer, more orderly and connected, and they are also more in his power. Even the adverse ones are, for he can reduce them, remove them, or paint them over with pleasing colors, yeah, such is the power of reason that it can wring pleasure out of pain itself. Reason has such great influences on the sensual powers of the soul. She exalts, embellishes, and enlarges them, and ennobles the beast into a kind of angel. But how excellent is this reason, considered in itself, and how great it makes man, since it opens the kingdom of truth before him and instructs him in the eternal laws of order and perfection. She leads him from step to step to the infinite perfect being, but it doesn't take her that long to get there, she shows it to him in every object, in a flower of the field, in an insect that unfolds its wings in the rays of the sun. She shows him more in nature, as the bare eyes show the animal, she reads in it the mind of God, the design and intentions of the Creator, the virtues of perfect goodness. This inner eye surpasses myriad bodily eyes, says Plato, for through this we discover things as they are. It sees how the whole system of truths flows from God, the eternal source of what is possible and real, and converges again in Him. It teaches us the laws of bliss. The rule of all movements of our souls of all actions of the whole man, and shows that the fundamental laws on which the welfare of men depends are the very same to which every archangel obeys, the very same by which God himself acts. Now let's take a look at what man has accomplished on this planet, who has been created to the first theater of his abilities. Everywhere we shall find the ruler of the earth. Here we see deserts transformed into blooming gardens, wildernesses and horrid forests transformed into fertile plains and forced to give abundance to innumerable inhabitants, whole countries snatched from the water, rocks hewn into comfortable dwellings for men. Here, pyramids and temples testify to the almighty art of man. The mere ruins of Persepolis are monuments that creatures who could command nature once dwelt there. Behold Apraxiteles giving life and grace to dead marble and drawing demigods out of stones. Here is an empty slate and some rubbed earth. In less time the hand of appels. Working after an invisible spirit. Charm our eyes with the lovely figure of a nymph, which no living beauty will see without jealousy. Who will believe that in these mute strings there are hidden harmonies that melt the heart and sweep the soul through the whole labyrinth of passions in a few minutes? But let a musician with fingers, each of which seems to have a soul, master these mute strings, and you will become louder ears, louder harmony, astonished at what a human being can do. By the influx of reason into the heart, virtue is produced, which alone is that which can make man worthy of its author, that goodness which finds its supreme joy in the happiness of all creatures, to do well those loving affections which are always busy. 
This love for everything what reminds us of the divine through beauty or perfection, that right mood of effects and feelings, which, with reason, or the eternal laws of order, make the most pleasing symphony. What is more beautiful than the virtuous man? And that it could be so is proved by these very ye books of all times, which, through the noble, generous, and benevolent examples of righteous people, mitigate the disgust which the examples of vices and excesses of the greater number inspire in us against our own nature, and which give us courage to believe that neither the force of a compelling fatality nor an inward malice of our nature can prevent us too from becoming as good as men have already been. Should man with such abilities only for this narrow circle, for this short time, created for a life that is more like a middle ground between being and non-being than a true life? We don't want to speculate for long. A divine light shines here where the last rays of reason are lost in uncertainty. God speaks and reveals to us the future and his intentions. Great intentions. Bright future. Man is capable of infinite refinement, man is created for eternity. Only this truth solves the otherwise incomprehensible riddle of human desires, which among infinite things find no object to exhaust them. This dark feeling of our destiny, this tendency towards the infinite, secretly works in every human breast. An Alexander who weeps on the furthest shore of the ocean, that to conquer other worlds, heaven has no bridge, Nero, who wants to heal the disgust of his soul through immense and gigantic joys, these themselves, much as they otherwise dish in a human nature, give here a testimony of their innate greatness, which still gleams from their ruins. These insatiable tendencies were destined for infinity. How beautiful is this picture of man, and who would believe that it was not in accordance with the truth? Or that a poet's mere imagination could produce anything more beautiful than the Creator wished to produce. But I have said nothing of man other than what experience and divine oracles confirm. Man is a rational creature, an image of divinity, a relative of angels, or an angel in animal form, which is ennobled and adorned by the indwelling spirit, one of the sublime beings who, like little subordinate gods, rule their spheres, and labor through wisdom and goodness for the common purpose of the whole system of the world. Angels are his relatives, angels care for him and record his deeds. Man alone thinks small of man, says Young. But shouldn't this make us doubt the truth of our painting? No. Man is in his disposition and according to his destiny as we have described him, it takes no little to spoil so glorious a work, but even in the remains of the mutilation we discover enough of an admirable work of a divine intellect. The whole perfection of man consists in abilities, which lie, as it were, wrapped in one another in the bosom of the soul, and need time, happy influences, and the impulsive warmth of tempered emotion to bloom into reality. If the eruption of this faculty is checked, either the cultivation of the soul is neglected altogether, or at least the proper order and attention to nature's pointers is neglected, thus a deformity must necessarily result, which, through its inequalities and lack of symmetry, leaves even the wise man in doubt as to how he is to justify their existence in a system so perfect and regular as the world of God is. Human nature is a very fragile beauty. This remark is made by all those in the know and, I fear, is sometimes misused is certain that the relationships between the soul forces are so subtle that it is very easy to violate their harmony. A single little mistake brings with it a whole series of little mistakes, from which very great evils finally arise. And because virtue or the rightness and health of the soul requires a well-measured activity of all mental powers, while vice requires only an excessive movement of sensuality, vice is undeniably easier than virtue and soon gains the upper hand, since it innumerable ways creeps into the soul and takes its seat in such powers where it so easily finds nourishment and can devour itself. Anyone who is not completely unfamiliar with the condition of the people will be more surprised that they are still so good than that they are so bad, as experience shows. Long gone are the golden days, if they ever existed outside the ideas of poets, men are not what they could and ought to be, though this does not at all reverse the divine purposes in man. We are entitled to search for the above description of one of the most beautiful and lovable creatures on this planet, but we find only ruins or buried remains, either mutilated or only half and soiled emerging from the mold. It is quite natural that in such circumstances the difference which the Creator intended to serve for the greater beauty of the whole human system, has degenerated into such a strange inequality that it is often difficult to distinguish creatures who are so out of harmony recognizable for children of a progenitor. 
one should almost forgive satirical minds among the pagans for having hit upon the idea of regarding the featherless, two-legged inhabitants of the earth as ridiculous freaks, which came to light when some deity had the strange idea, grotesque in all diligence to do work. Yet, on closer inspection, one finds more traces of the grandeur of human nature, and more real beauty in the human world, than one would find if one merely studied it from the records of Rabelais, or from Gulliver's travels. I have been persuaded of this, having found or thought to find, for so we ought to be accustomed to say, that all man-like creatures whom the old school ways could talk, laugh, and turn grey, taken together. As having been accorded distinctive privileges over other animals. With all their differences in outward appearance, colour, way of life, dress, form of government, religion, and customs, nevertheless fall into five classes, which have very precise relationships among one another and together no such thing even badly set up system with each other. I will give a description of each of these classes, as briefly as clarity will permit. The first is the lowest, and the closest to the animal kingdom. I include in it the large crowd of people whose best part not only remains in its natural rawness, but is gradually so disfigured that it almost completely loses the natural beauty that gleams from underneath, whose delicate faculties remain partly undeveloped, partly are spoiled in working, who never mature into real people. Their ignorance turns into stupidity over the years, and the sensuous impulses which grow up with them, and learn to obey no lawful authority, exude a multitude of prejudices which thickly cover the discriminating sense of good and evil. The prerogative of human nature, they degenerate in time into dominant tendencies, which are modified only according to the nature of temperament and external circumstances. These people are therefore very sensual creatures, impetuous in their passions, fickle, short-sighted, stubborn and yet credulous and therefore easy to deceive. Imagination is their reason, outward appearance is the reason for their decision, their wanting and not wanting. They are mostly condemned to care only for the body. Hence they inculcate a low and bestial mindset, that they can never rise above the earth where their fodder grows. Their manners are as clumsy as their tastes, their pleasures few and of the coarsest kind, on the other hand, ignorance, superstition, fear, and faint-heartedness greatly increase the number of their evils. It is no wonder that this sort of man does not know happy life, since they are so very little what man ought to be and a secret instinct always tells them that they are no mere beasts. Though they be ruled by tyrants, often belonging to their own kind, are so kept. It is easy to see that it is not to be thought of that this middle class between humans and yahoos will ever be ennobled to something higher. I'm afraid that's as far as impossible. But one also sees at once that the nature of these people makes them not only capable of being governed, but indispensable to them. If one knows how to make wise use of their inclination to the new and wonderful, their indolence and timidity, and their other passions, these must help to keep them in as much order as is necessary to prevent our earth don't become a mess. One must not forget that there are grades among this rabble too, but if we examine closely, the difference will ultimately be scarcely greater than the difference between a court coquette in a gala dress and between a coquette in a bodice, or between a fool in a smock and a fool with a ribbon. In the other class I put the great multitude of people of better fortune who make pleasure and pastime the end of their lives. These will make up almost the greater part of those two worlds which are commonly called the great world and the beautiful world. These people seem to regard our earth as a great masquerade place, where anyone is allowed to be what he wants, provided only the great purpose of killing time is achieved. You make yourself more acquainted with this world than the first class. They run for pleasure, all her other passions are but attendants of the propensity for pleasure. Wit, that dangerous monkey of reason, is its idol. He teaches her the poisonous but sweet art of deceiving herself. He puts the future and every serious truth in distance and shadow, and puffs small childish delights to gigantic greatness. It heats up the imagination and shows it nothing but enchanted regions. He invents laws other than the eternal tablets of the divine will, or he alters, expands, and diminishes them. Man is made into a fine, lust breathing beast, whose pleasures are only more varied, more extensive, and more artificial than those of other animals. Her soul seems to bubble in her blood, as long as this wallet. So are you. They are so comfortable in this world that they have no time to think of a better one, and if it did, it would have to be Mahom's paradises. This class, however, differs from the first. A finer disposition, more tender feelings, more vivacity of spirit, taste, wit and politeness make that difference. I don't want to go into what they have in common now. 
It is to these people that we have to thank for the agreeable misuse of the fine arts, which has almost entirely supplanted use, and for the invention of innumerable instruments of voluptuousness, adornments and courtesy, fashions and games. They have certainly beautified one part of the world, but always at the expense of another. The men of the first class are slaves to the pleasures of their brethren of the second. They tire themselves of providing them with the necessities and comforts of life, and are compelled to be inventive in order to constantly provide them with new toys. Thus they alternately keep each other active. How beautiful and good would people become if they could be persuaded to confuse the objects of their affections with better ones, and to draw joy from purer sources. Truth can do something about this if it allows itself to be made up with wit. But seldom does anything have a stronger effect on such soft-hearted minds than weariness, old age, and what one is accustomed to call misfortunes. The usual effects of this in them are either misanthropy, a kind of fever which afflicts their good hours, in which they at least remember their former pleasures or a certain fanatical impulsion of imagination and heart. Producing a tendency to get away from it all to disembodied who refuses his services. A great contempt for this world that is leaving us, and a rapturous longing for the invisible one that is now most comfortable, because one needs only a heated imagination to enjoy them. It is well known that the most beautiful part of the human race is primarily to blame, that many of them come up with the idea of becoming pure spirits after they see themselves forced to relinquish the title of earthly angels. These two classes have in common the misfortune, that the sensuous soul controls the whole man in a despotic manner, from which must necessarily arise a thousand erratic eccentricities and domestic disturbances, which often endanger his whole happiness. The third class is occupied by the speculative minds, which constitute a considerable part of the human race, from the grammarian who calculated how often each letter occurs in Homer to the Farker, who strives to become nothing himself through the most profound reflections on nothing, as the origin of all things. These people seem to be mere spectators in this world. Gaping at her as if they had no further connection with her, and, to make matters worse, most waste their attention on what a wise man scarcely thinks worth a glimpse of. This class, like the previous ones, is divided into many distinct genera. Some, to whom the earth seems too small, because it is only dust from the sun compared to the whole celestial system, have devoted themselves entirely to the sky, although they see almost nothing in it but disorder and deviations from their rules, which they resolve as best they can strive. One could believe they borrowed fire from the spheres to awaken and nourish the devotion and direction of the soul towards the eternal, they became accustomed to a higher and purer mind than other mortals, and to a more vivid sense of the high destiny of human nature. But that's not it. They just calculate what kind of lines the planets revolve around the sun, or how far the dog star is from Earth. Other not so high flying spirits humbly content themselves with the contemplation of summer birds and all kinds of vermin. They know their number and call them by name. Others crawl under the rubble of ancient ruins, understand tongues that have been lost, and explain the mysterious figures on the table of Isis. Others torment themselves to demonstrate the whole extent of morality from a single principle. Others prove the immortality of the soul from reason, some invent new edifices to bother others to overthrow again. Some speculate until they begin to doubt all that is, others prove by a long series of inferences that it is noon when the sun burns upon the vortex. Many spend their lives trying to gather together all the opinions, inventions, dreams and truths, good and bad, of all other writers, without thinking what to do with this treasure. Most of these strange people tire themselves out in trifles, and the few who occupy themselves with more important things have the misfortune to regard truth as a mere object of contemplation, a thing lovely to behold, like the tree of knowledge. They are like the keepers of a sultan's beautiful slave girls, who have permission to see but not the right to enjoy, or the enchanted dragons of the old Romans, guarding great treasures in subterranean caves, the value or use of which is unknown to them. The fourth class is, I fear, much less numerous than the preceding. And now we shall soon guess that she is the best. She is indeed the true adornment of the earth, and if there is anything else on it that can draw English eyes down, it is the lives of these amiable people, to whom nature has a fortunate disposition to a harmonious disposition, has bestowed a fine sense of beauty and noble tendencies for the good. Without having any faculties to an extraordinary degree, they are discerning enough to discern truth from appearances, and to penetrate through the blindnesses of imagination, passion, and habit. Virtue seems to have a privileged right to their hearts. They despise the meanness of the soul that loves only itself. Her joy is doing good. 
the inclination for pleasure may be the principal enlivening of their youth, but it is guarded by an equally strong love of honor, and both gradually lead them to the purer springs of virtue. They can err, uh, they can be blinded by a careless tilt or lured into byways. But her heart is no malice. No deceit, incapable of envy, incapable of meanness, her open mind, the kindness of her heart, her honesty towards herself never let her stray far, bring her back soon and always promote her further. These alone are in the right mood for friendship and true tenderness. For them, nature is beautiful, for them there are so many fine and exhilarating joys in the connections of society. They enjoy the world with reason, but they are not attached to it. If it be true that living examples and speaking pictures are of more use to virtue than moral or metaphysical dissertations, surely this small number of active sages, of both sexes, contribute more to the real advantage of men than the whole incalculable world of speculative one scholars. Methinks I have now all mortals, as different as they may appear, their classes assigned, save for the strange and rare spirits, which have been found so exalted above the rest of men, that they are wont to be distinguished by the name genii, which otherwise denotes beings of a higher order. Their number is as great as God finds necessary to maintain moral order or to chastise men. For there are benevolent and evil genii. Both agree that they have unusual abilities and, if I may say so, something colossal in the shape of their minds. From youth they are distinguished by a burning desire for knowledge, a diligence which obstacles only bolster. A liberty of the soul so unteaching to bear the yoke that it sometimes jumps over the necessary barriers. A certain enthusiasm of the imagination, which uncovers a thousand ideas unknown to them, and something heroic in heart, which enables them to great deeds. Through the development and training of these great faculties through science, reflection, knowledge of the world, and experience, they at last attain that penetrating sharpness of mind and manly strength of mind, which sets them so far above the common people. The sphere in which such forces are to act must necessarily be large. They are destined to be legislators, teachers, leaders of the human race. They should overlook the whole, take care of the whole. From them shall come the schemes of how to lessen man's troubles, and how to increase their advantages. And just because the obstacles that stand in the way of execution are so great in number and weight, they were endowed with so much strength, with such far-sighted insights, with such a lively instinct for the great and glorious. With such mighty enthusiasm. With it they really do the good for people that weaker, although well-meaning spirits can only wish for them. Those among these genii who are true to their destiny are like the English guardian spirits who, according to the pious opinion of the ancients, watch over the world, govern the spheres, and carry out the Creator's command on this side of heaven. They have everything that other people lack to make themselves happy, they are made for governing, like these for obedience. They banish ignorance and combat prejudice and practical error, monsters a thousand times more pernicious than those whose extermination earned Hercules a place among the Greek gods. They bring light, truth and order into human life. They teach or guard the sacred laws of nature, which are the sources of all other laws. They tame and soften the savagery and harshness of men, improve, educate, and polish their manners, they teach what is decent, what is noble, what is beautiful, and so they make true to a certain extent the fable which ascribed to the magical lute of Orpheus the power to pacify wild beasts. How sad it is that such faculties can be misused. That such spirits may miss their end and fall from their majesty, that they lose sight of the true honor of being benefactors of men, and, deceived by the false glimmer of imagined divinity, by a chimera, by an empty sound, may become destroyers of the world. When I see an Alexander running for laurels. Methinks I see the ability of an angel to do the works of an insect. Shall desire so small, so base, come into heavenly souls? Mastering oneself is the highest level of sovereignty. Whoever cannot do this has lost the right to usurp the government of men. How unfortunate it is when heroes think wrongly. How important it is that these know what is truly great and glorious. How necessary is it that these feel that they depend on something higher, that his laws are their guide, that they can only be like him in doing good. A genius who turns to the evil side. A conqueror, a destroyer, a seducer of men, is a monster the uglier, the bigger and lovelier he would have been if he had stayed in his proper career. A fallen angel is a thousand times uglier than the worst human. The love of fame really only exists in great souls and only grows so great in them that all other inclinations have to give way to it. 
What is called lust for glory and ambition among people who really belong in the rabble is only disguised self-interest, they wish to be respected and great, in order to be able to indulge base desires the better. Because the passions are the winds that set us in motion, so see I ennoble this noble ambition of great minds as necessary in order to promote them to their destiny and to overcome the obstacles. But we see from history how harmful storms it produces if reason does not moderate it and give it the right direction. Geniuses have never bothered with trifles. Their endeavors always interest people. And that extends to their games. There are people who are great in small things, but they belong to the third class. We have now surveyed men as they really are in their various classes, and the gradation which shows in them deserves to be noticed. We found immature, uneducated people, and these were the majority. People who only train the sensual perfections, those who only want to be intelligences, a small number of those whose moral goodness makes them lovable, and finally fully developed and, as far as this world will permit, complete human beings, which must therefore be great and majestic creatures. If we take the best of all these classes together, we get the man I described at the beginning. And so I have achieved part of my purpose. There is no doubt that the human race has a very beautiful side. But what do we want to flatter ourselves? It is almost entirely eclipsed by the ugly one. I blush, I tremble when I consider the innumerable outbursts of nonsense, the black deeds, the shame with which so many men have branded their sex, when I consider the number and magnitude of the evils that oppress us. Unruly, animal passions, who become most dangerous when jokes protect them, vile selfishness, sucking into its maelstrom all it can reach, oblivion of the most sacred. Irrefutable duties we have to our creator and overlord. To the world and to human society, shameful hypocrisy, with which one thinks to deceive the omniscient himself, superstition, which alone has done more harm to the peace and order of the human race than all other vices, tyrants and arbitrary violence, in a word, such a deep degree of disorder that I can think of nothing but moral chaos immediately beneath it. The largest lot are slaves, mindless, bound, abused slaves, slaves to wanton violence, to fanaticism, to habit, and, what is worst, their own unreasonableness and their passions. Without this inner slavery, those monsters would have no power over them. And what do these great royal spirits, these geniuses, of whom one should expect so much? Most abuse their supremacy to lead those wretched and deceived slaves further into their ruin, and think they have done best if they can persuade the unfortunate to go to the slaughter voluntarily, or at least to have pleasant dreams when they are unhappy waking. And these sharp-sighted, Thinking minds, who would have the dexterity to spy out the magnitude of our misery, its sources, and the most useful antidotes. They count the sands of the sea, measure the immeasurable, rummage around in the bowels of nature. As if all important business were already done, and pass their lives in subtleties, the greatest worth of which is to keep them from doing something worse. How offensive are these all too founded reflections to a heart that has a feeling for the welfare or misery of its fellow creatures? It is true that there have been excellent legislators and teachers, and what would have happened without them? I admire and honor a Confucius, a Minos, a Lycurgus. I recognize the strength of her spirit, the wide range of her insights, her deep knowledge of people. The designs they have made are such as might be expected from the keenness of their minds and required for the permanence of a well-established state. It is not the intention here to get involved in the assessment of their laws and regulations. It should only be remarked that none of these great minds wished to plant in his state anything better than a political virtue. They made all the considerations which they had to make for their purpose. They knew the people before them, their way of life, and all the external circumstances on which they depended, they overlooked the present and looked deep into the future. But they took the liberty of doing violence to human nature in order to attain their ends, cried out ignorance, deceit, and superstition, cared little for the deviation of their system from the immutable and divine laws of nature. Which unite all men without distinction of place. Time, climate, national character. Big mistake, which necessarily had to do great harm. Despite all their keenness, they did not see deeply enough into human nature and destiny. They neglected his immediate dependence on God, the foundation of all truth, law and connection, and did not know or consider that man was created for eternity. Is there no legislator who sees through man thoroughly and has extended his intentions to all? Which the feathered Indian, the ardent Moor, the voluptuous Peruvian, the sluggish Laplander, the fluttering Frenchman, and the profound Englishman, all might obey. 
and whose laws would ameliorate and curtail the faults of climate, temperament, and national character which the rest of the legislators so much indulge. Laws that quicken the lazy, temper the hot-tempered, soothe the savage, which must please the Huron, the Kaffir, the Indian, the European, the Greenlander alike. Simple few laws, founded on infallible credit. Bearing their reward. Standing on principles. Assuring us of supreme happiness. If there are such laws, Socrates would say, God must have made them. And indeed God made them. They are none other than the laws of moral virtue, backed up with the almighty motives of the Christian religion. The soul of Christianity consists in the living knowledge of these two principles, that God, the Creator, Sovereign and Judge of men, is at the same time their Father and merciful and has given Himself every possible kind relationship towards us, to connect us in any way possible, and then, that man, who is created for eternity, should never view this life in any other way than in relation to the future, from which it first receives its value and true determination. Man, as a creature, as a rational creature, as an able creature, is subject to the general laws of order and perfection which make this world what it is. To obey these laws is to obey the voice of God. And, as an immortal and heaven-born being, he must live according to the dignity of his nature and the grandeur of his future estate. His present life must be one of constant conformity to the laws of God, and an earnest preparation for the future. Common experience has long taught that reverence for God and hope of everlasting happiness after death can do a great deal over the heart and mind of man. All peoples have given samples of this. The fault is that one does not assert these two feelings enough and does not use their full strength. In order to ensure that belief in God and immortality reigns supreme over our souls, one makes just as many preparations as Lycurgus does to make love of the fatherland and quarrelsomeness in his small state the driving wheels that move everything, just do away with all conflicting concepts, maxims and habits, following his example. And set everything up according to these basic ideas. And success cannot and will not fail to materialize. Or should it be impossible set up a state according to the same? Truly, if the Republic of Lycurga still existed as a mere idea, any connoisseur of human nature would consider it incomparably more difficult to bring about than a Republic of Christians.